<laughs> okay, welcome everybody, and thank you for being at this session. I'm really excited that I found out that I have been um, approved or my session has been um, admitted in visual form. I feel like being a part of a group of geek people. <laughs> 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 so thank you for, so much for having me and for being here and for being interested in this topic, which is taking it taking on a lot of importance uh, late, as of lately, as I, as I see in the community. Uh, it should have been only or you know this time that it's, it was like that, but lately it seems to be more important. Yeah. So uh, uh, my name is Dr. Kaya Jordan. Um, to give you a little bit of background about uh, me, why I'm here, about what this is. and I came to Iowa to study. I studied uh, at Iowa State University. I have a PhD in human computer interaction. Uh, this field focuses more on usability. And accessibility, but both things overlap. I have, um, I wouldn't go as far as saying developed, but built a website uh, since 1999. I learned HTML by hand and an old uh, software called PageMail. I don't know if that any of you have ever heard of that, but uh, my first website, I designed it in a um, package called um, Painter, which was really difficult to put together. So anyways, I have some background in that sense, and um, I have a master's in anthropology because I, I always had like both interest in technology and human, and human beings. So ACI was a perfect field for me in that sense that blended both together. And now I am the web accessibility coordinator at Iowa State since uh, January the first ever. Yeah, so she's the first web accessibility coordinator at Iowa State University, and um, I was really excited when she came to the university. Uh, Zaire and I met right away. I think it was right when you started. And we've had some wonderful conversations um, with uh, our team, and we've really um, enjoyed working with her. And my name is Ann Griesel, and I am a graphic designer, Drupal builder, I'll say, because <laughs> I'm more comfortable saying that. Others might say differently. Um, I do project management and training in Drupal and the platform that our team has, has created for the university to you. So we're just excited to be here and we appreciate um, being able to, to be with you today. We would like to have essentially a conversation today with you. Um, yes, we, we have a presentation and we can kind of stand up here and give you a nice presentation on some things and we want you and hope that you learn from us and that you learn from each other and that you can teach us some things that you're doing because that's really what's what's important is that we can collaborate and we can share together so please feel very free to ask questions mm -hmm. or organically please Let yes be a conversation. don't don't be afraid to ask us in anything during the presentation so as you probably see on the session description we had kind of like an agenda, but we wanted to um, summarize it. And basically what we're going to talk is about what is accessibility, specifically web or digital accessibility, as it's been called uh, more uh, recently. And then we're going to talk about the reasons why we should care about accessibility, which may be apparently obvious, but maybe some, maybe not. So, mm -hmm. and then Anne is going to go on. Yeah, so then uh, towards the last third, uh, of the presentation, we will talk about how to implement web accessibility and improve it essentially into the sites that you already have. Uh, most of the sites you have are, I'm sure, following web accessibility standards to at least a, you know a certain level that just need improvement. And it's important, I think, to understand how you can improve the health of your site very you know quickly. And there's some free tools out there. So what we would like to do is to show you some of those tools and simulations. We get really excited about simulations because that's something that you can actually collaborate with your teams on. And we'll talk about how you can take back some of these concepts that we're talking about today. Well, you're fine. No, uh, well, okay. we showed, we showed yeah. them. Anyways, <laughs> my point with this was ask you guys before yeah. showing this, what is what what is what is the first thing that comes to mind when you hear accessibility? 
rounds, right? <laughs> Good answer. Well, you, know, you guys might have yeah. heard of it in the digital context, but many people, most people, think about rounds and circles. And that there's a uh, historical reason for that, precisely. Universal design and accessibility was first um, concern of the realm of architecture. And there was this guy, Ron Mace, who coined the term universal design. And universal design was a movement within architecture to make physical spaces more responsive to the needs of all users, including users with disabilities. It's not only devoted to thinking about persons with disabilities, but all users to the greatest extent possible. So, uh, as you see here, universal design of conflict reading acts. Uh, concerns with usability, accessibility, and inclusion. So for that reason, it's an ideal paradigm or an ideal framework for talking about web accessibility as well. But um, that's that's the historical root. And uh, the definition itself, um, I wanted to uh, quote from Rowling himself. He coined the term as he used it to describe the concept of designing all products from the built environment to the aesthetic and usable to the greatest extent possible by everyone, regardless of their age, ability, or status in life. He was also a great advocate of workers with disabilities, so that he had that um, understanding and, and concern throughout his professional career. Um, it gained popularity in the 80s, and then uh, as a result of the spread of the web and the internet and people thinking about the web and the internet as a digital space, the terms were really applicable to that realm. So they are, uh, I guess, extrapolated to the realm of the web and digital spaces. The principles of universal design, I'm showing them an adaptation, I'm showing you an adaptation of uh, uh, first style for the universal design for higher, higher education. And as you see here, there are principles, these are principles that basically speak to our, um, I guess, moral values of equity and having all persons be able to have access to things, not only information and spaces, but everything. So as you see here, equitable, flexible, simple and intuitive, perceptible, all these things seem to more or less apply to the things that we do on the internet in the digital content. Uh, so that's why they were extrapolated into this realm. And then we go into what is specifically web accessibility. And we have a definition brought up by the World Wide Web Consortium, the W3C, which says that but it not only means that, it also means that it benefits people without disabilities. Just like the ramps and the curb cuts have been adopted by persons like the mom who's driving a stay along or uh, pushing a uh, <laughs> or uh, when we go shopping and we have a car and we push our car up the ramp. Things like that, we take advantage of those, uh, I guess, uh, evolution in, in design. That's precisely what happens with the web. When we design for thinking in accessibility in mind, we also design. We design uh, and bring benefits to people of all kinds. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the why, the reasons why. Mm -hmm. So. Essentially, we really um, care about accessibility lately. It's been kind of a hot topic, I feel like. Um, just recently, within the last few years, it's really started to drive home. And there's been an amazing, you know, from what I've seen with Drupal 8, there's been actually a lot of um, talks. There's been some at DrupalCon uh, in New Orleans. I believe Phase 2 did one. There's also documentation uh, that you can see looking at Drupal 8 in the ways that it's approaching accessibility. So why do we actually care about accessibility? Other than like the humanity like side of things, I think that we need to really care about others. But it's also because some of, some of us in higher ed and other places are seeing cases, actually cases come to fruition and people saying, you know, this site needs to be accessible to visually impaired. This site needs to be accessible to those with low hearing. You know, where's the captioning? 
Where's these other types of needs that everyone has, you know, everyone essentially has. And, and like Zayura said, it actually comes down to usability so that it helps those who even aren't necessarily low of hearing be able to interact with the environment you're giving them in a web, web space. Because maybe they're in a location, like a coffee shop or somewhere, and they're trying to listen to something and they forgot their headphones and they need to be able to see this video because they're going to go meet with somebody and, and, and captioning will allow them, allow us to, to experience those interactions that we normally may or may not be able to have with the web space. So. Okay, so I'm going to go into the more kind of boring type of thing. <laughs> but I wanted to turn the corner because I've seen the movie that you guys might not have seen ever. It's like on a photo time. If you saw the captions in the film, those captions, uh, if you watch this movie on Netflix, that's just the same captions now available. If you watch it on Netflix, those captions that were there were in the results of, of the legal case that was for a complaint that was brought up by the National Association of the And uh, I, guess, I guess they settled with Netflix, and as a result, Netflix uh, from 2014 on has had to have captions in all the movies. Because the web or the internet was considered a, public, a, a place of public accommodation. So just like if you're uh, going to the middle of downtown, it's a place of public accommodation, or if you go to a federal building, it's a place of public accommodation. The internet is a place of public accommodation, and as that, for, for that reason, you have to allow the people of every background to be able to access whatever information you provide in the internet. So there are there are at least two laws, federal laws, that apply to these requirements. The Rehabilitation Act of 1973 and the uh, American with Act of 1990, I believe. Title 2 and 3. And there are local laws as well. In Iowa, there's the Iowa Civil Rights Act that applies to that as well. So, in those laws, call for up to basically providers of experiences, free users, even you know, all users, including users with disabilities, the same type of tool. You see here other types of reasons why we should care about disability and the universal design in our physical design. And uh, Mr. Lego guy, Lego guy in Tim Birch brought up some of those yesterday. And I was really excited when I heard accessibility and searching and optimization because it does help with that. It helps with the kind of ability. And these are data from WCC Consortium as well. They provide this information. This is the business case for as you see here, it increases use and stickiness of tangibility and goodwill, and it decreases the possibility of legal costs. And you might have an initial uh, increased investment in time in terms of your development time, but it does have a number of benefits that pay off at the end. And finally, like Anne said, there's the human resource. Um, accessibility is a human right, and it's as such has been recognized by the United Nations Convention for Persons with Disabilities, Article 21. And I'm going to read and quote exactly what it says. Countries are to promote access to information by providing information intended for the general public in accessible formats and technologies by facilities facilitating the use of Braille, sign language, and other forms of communication, and by encouraging the media and internet providers to make online information available in accessible formats. So you see there that the United Nations, United Nations has pronounced itself about these concerns that are, all, are also reflected in many of the missions of our own institutions. I know this at Iowa State. I know this at most of if, if not all of the higher education institutions in this country, is a, it's a democratic value and it's, I guess, a human, a human value. Mm -hmm. So Anne is going to talk a little bit more about these mm -hmm. things, which yeah. are more technical. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, what I'm going to do is just touch on this. I think some of you, most of you that have seen um, 
the standards that exist, you can go to the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines and maybe get overwhelmed almost immediately. Um, <laughs> I, I uh, yeah, I've been overwhelmed several times, but uh, there is actually a quick guide, and I'm I think I'm going to keep the PowerPoint going for now, but at the end, we're going to show you some of these tools. But there is a quick guide that will help you uh, filter and actually determine the different levels, um, the different changes that you can make to abide by the various standard levels. So if you're not familiar with these, there are essentially, um, on the WCAG standards, three of them. There's the A, AA, and AAA. What's nice to know is that these build upon each other. So if you're following a AA standard, you should also be following, they're expecting you to be following the A standard. So when you can filter through and see, oh, I need alt tags and I need my links to do these certain things, we'll talk about some fast ways to get yourself to the A and, and focus on AA standards. There's also a really neat resource that Zaira found and we've been talking about Luke McGrath's um, site on web, web accessibility. What he's done is put some of these requirements more in a, from my perspective, a blog, sans comments kind of environment where you can view some of these standards, what they mean, how you should use them, and how you should focus on them in more of a straightforward terminology that you could read through quite quickly and, and grasp at least some of these concepts pretty uh, fast. Before we move on, yeah. if I may, uh, when we talk about uh, level A, level A, and level A, mm -hmm. just so you know guys, most of uh, the settlements that are mm -hmm. part of the legal landscape, at least in the higher education institutions, bring up WICA or WCAD 2.0 level A as the de facto standard. So, the federal government itself hasn't pronounced in terms of how to comply or the requirements specifically to look at other than five away that you might find online. But in most settlements, what they bring up is this double A, double double A, three to extend or guidelines. Yeah. So at this point, what I'd like to do is take a moment and see if there's any questions that we can help you answer. Is there anything that you're specifically wondering about in regards to standards or questions that you have about the definition of web accessibility and digital accessibility so far? Yes. Languages? No mm -hmm. conversation is, I think it's a triple, triple A level type requirement. So it's not, it's not required of the level to say so much, but it's something really good to have. I mean. So we're not planning on addressing that specifically, however, we can show you some resources and tools that you can use to dive into and actually understand quite a bit more. And that's really our goal today is to provide you with, we'll provide our, our PowerPoint, we also have additional resources that I may upload for you. I've got two or three pages of things so <laughs> that you, Zaire and I have been collecting over the last few days that, it, you know, don't look at it as daunting, just you know, kind of click on one and look at it and you'll dive in and find out where to go next, but give you that jumping point. Yes? Yes. Um, 
we commercial data is, is individual development with all different kinds of backgrounds and stuff. I've learned a lot about things that are not in our wheelhouse just because I'm not younger. So that's something that I go through yeah. that that was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There are automatic tools, there are port, like paid tools that you can resort to, and there are free tools that mm -hmm. you may resort to. I have a list, and we're going to show mm -hmm. you at least one of them that is really popular. It does, it's not a, a store because it doesn't check your whole code, it just like checks page by page if you submit a web page. There are tools out there that you may resort to if you want to check your whole code in your whole website. And I can like we, yeah. maybe we can talk about those a little bit more sure. later. Sure. Yeah, we we definitely could go into those. I personally, I feel like I, I think what you're getting at is, you know, when you're actually automate doing automated testing, you can actually kind of bake this into the process where you're not actually needing to involve a human. The problem is, I feel that the technology I don't know is quite there to the point that it is yeah. for the for the other sort of testing that you're doing. So when we're doing code testing, there's some great tools and ways that we can do that or write our own testing or, you know, verify that this is, yes, this is working, no, this is not working, and provide you a list. Whereas with web accessibility, I think it's a little bit more complicated. The reality um, is that, oh, sorry, but I don't know. The reality is that uh, automatic tools only tend to detect 40% of the errors, to put it somehow, because most of these, these things are only, you know, perceivable through, you know, having the experience, the user experience, and have the user, I ha actually, I have users with disabilities test the code or test, actually, the implementation so that they can, they can go through it with a screen reader or they can go through it as they would because I can't presume of being a user with a disability that I don't have. So I think that's the best way of, of going about it. Try to compromise or you know try to address it with automatic uh, tools. Yeah. And so I, something we need is a lot of data tools. Yes. Like dumb things. Like yeah. Maybe identify this as a volunteer opportunity for people like who have access. Yes. Hey, here's a list of issues that mm -hmm. you know, just like they come out of the technical, you know, wow, mm -hmm. and now we want somebody to actually use this to this point. Yeah. The other thing that, uh, just to keep talking about this, because this is a kind of big thing for me, um, I've had the opportunity to work with two to three hundred web editors and like responsible for training them all and they all have a different site and they all do different things and they all add content in different ways and whatnot, right? So site improve is something that I've stumbled upon and I've used and it's called site improve. Yeah. So digital cost. Well they have an accessibility feature but it's and that's good for basic you know solution to code. But um, if you walk into Office 1 PDFs, then that's a separate yeah. problem you have to add on. Yeah. Because so, yeah. we've got those two issues where you have developers doing the site that develops the code, and you need that to, to be compliant. And then when you turn it over to the users, they can take your wonderfully accessible site and tank it by loading these PDFs that are the annual reports that were created in. Um, uh, and I've really come to the conclusion that as a technical person it's important to be able to at least give the tools to the editors and the empowerment to the editors so when they feel excited is what's important one other thing about Site Improve is that it does allow you to prioritize. So when you say, I'm trying to get to a double A standard, it's going to prioritize all of these fixes for your content editors so they're not overwhelmed, right? You know, I cannot walk into a room of 200 editors or send them an email and say, okay, guys, you need to do these 45 things, right? Um, you say, this month we're going to work on alt tags. Here's everything you need to know about an alt tag. So. That is also something I found to be very helpful. Are there any other questions that we can talk about? Any tips on the training, short leading them, how you get users to? Yeah. 
continue using best practices. Because yeah, but that's our biggest problem. Yeah. We can get the base site great, and then you know, many <laughs> yeah. times I've cracked the ball up and I go back and look on the site and there's no tags. And yes. You know, there's certain things you can. Because you can yeah. work that. You can make that required. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you can make the alternative yeah. required, but it doesn't stop someone. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> or or actually, with an alt tag, some people don't know this, but you know, if you have a decorative image, you're just putting up a background image, or you have some sort of decorative element that you're adding, there should not be an alt tag. So it's also kind of a double-edged sword where you really have to see now at the university and academic level, from what I've seen, um, most people are uploading an image that has a purpose to be uploaded. But yeah. The image. That there's adoption parts making it required, but then again, you have to educate people, yeah. content editors, as to best, best practices for this image description. So, this actually flows really nicely um, into what, what we were going to talk about next. This is a brief, brief slide for you, but there's a couple key things from working with Sayura that I've learned over the last couple months that as someone who's been working with the web and these content editors didn't actually know. So one of them I've already told you, which in alt text is <laughs> if there's a decorative image, you don't need, you shouldn't have alt text. The other is if you have an image where somebody has put text over the top of it, a text overlay, that alt text should be exactly the text that's overlaid. So if you have a graphic designer or somebody who has created, you know, a corn cob, and it says sweet corn on it, the alt text should say sweet corn. Nothing more, nothing less. Because you're giving the same experience to someone who's visually impaired as someone who's visually. Yeah, so if, the, it, it like, you know, like a black box over the top that says sweet corn. <laughs> because what, what you're doing when you're creating that box is drawing attention to those words. And so someone who's visually impaired you want to have similar experience in drawing attention to those words. It also tells them where they're going, what they're learning about. The, the, an old mistake that I've done is alt text photo of corn cob with sweet corn <laughs> on top. Well, that you don't need, first of all, you don't need photo of because the screen reader, and we're going to show you an example of that, says image, image, link. Link, you know, and various headings, it'll tell you the level. So, 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 so those are things nice to pass along to your editors. Yes? Uh, uh, so, just putting the word sweet corn in there, though, is not the same experience as someone right. who can visually see the picture and those words. There's yes. Two things to that. So, so you, yeah. don't you my, think it should be more descriptive? My rule of thumb yeah. is be contextually static. Look at the image, how you're placing it, try to be empathetic to a user that can't see that image. What would you like to convey to that user? Exactly. If, the, if there's an image that is kind of like repetitive, don't, don't say the same thing about the second image. Things like that, you have to take into account. Yeah, and the other thing I think, too, what I've, what I've seen people do is there is an image over the top, and so they don't actually. They use different words to describe the image that do not include the words that are on top of the image. You know, I, I, it, want and so it's very hard to <coughs> convey that. So very yes. So I think you're you're right. There should be a combo. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So keeping keeping that alt text short and concise, and also taking into consideration the experience you want to provide is important. Yes. Will the screen reader read the file, like the source? If you're if you're linking to a file, so well, I mean the image. I was wondering. SRC equals file. No. No. Mm -hmm. 
depends on the season. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't I'm assisted tool. And you say if it's not description worthy, if you do not include the description, you at least include a blank description. All equals yeah. quote quote. Yeah. The other um, couple of items here are with col dealing with color. So one thing I learned, you know, when you create a link. It should be, it's nice to have it in a color that people know that it's a link, you know, either abiding by the brand that you have for your web site or, uh, you know, some contrast standards. So I'll kind of talk about both. But it should also include an underline or some other way to show that that link is actually a link because those with color blindness. Um, have a hard time distinguishing a link if it doesn't have a second way to show them that it's a link. And when you look at contrast, I've had, th there's different contrast um, tools that you can use where you can put two different colors in and it will tell you um, how much the ratios are for those two colors. But even in a you know, I, I've been a graphic designer, like I said, so you have visual guidelines, you've got primary, secondary, and tertiary colors that you should use, and you might say, I'm going to use this primary color because it's larger, and then I'm going to put the text in this other color, and it's, it's in the brand, it's in the system, I can use it, and it looks good to me. Um, it's also important to put those two colors together and actually see, do they have enough contrast for someone, someone to, you know, read that text or know that there's a difference between those two colors. And headings, this is something I've run into with content editors that you can really talk about. Whereas if you take some text as a subhead, make it bold, and then you take some text and make it an H3, they're gonna, they could look the same you know, to, to somebody designing or looking at, at a website. So it's important to explain how we all know that it's, especially for SEO and you know, experiences that we have these H1 through H6 tags, but also that's going to help with the hierarchy of the web experience for someone with low vision. And so there's multiple layers to how and why some of these things are important. We also have a nice uh, little surprise for you. Site, or, I'm sorry, um, buildamodule.com has provided you with a free 24-hour pass for you to look at some of their um, tutorials for Drupal. But uh, Chris Shattuck also has, I don't know if you know this, several tutorials on accessibility. And so I have really enjoyed listening to those. And I contacted him last week. He's been a good supporter of Drupal Corn for quite a while now. And he said absolutely and provided you this opportunity. So the accessibility bits that he has are really concise, straightforward, using Drupal sites, talking about things that are related to Drupal. They give you just an overview and a really good concept of some of these ideas to take back and even take back to your teams. It's with these tools that I guess essentially I don't know the do it other than you know black over white inherently it's very a, compressing, right? Yeah, it's, it's a website yeah. where you input hex codes. Um, yeah. yeah, sorry, yeah, and we'll show you that. We've got what's the ratio on black to white? I don't know. Oh, <laughs> it would be what one, one two? I would assume. One, two. None? That's what the tool is for. Nobody reads the <laughs> yeah, nobody know. reads the spec. You just put your thing in the tool. Tool. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Perfect. We're going to walk in. Zaire is going to just go through some of these. We're going to tell you what some of these tools are, and then we will show you what they are. We're going to play. So 
Um, what, we have enough time? Oh, yeah, we got, we've got time. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we're good. I want to see okay, it. so the first we're one is it. really cool. It. It's a color blindness simulator that I found. And uh, I wasn't even aware that color blindness comes in many colors. So I thought that it was only green and red that got, you know, confounded or whatever. But there's actually monochromatic and um, other sorts of color blindness. One in every 12 men are color blind, one in every 200 women. So it's something that happens fairly frequently. Uh, so you can research this and we're going to look at it in a minute. And then there's a hearing loss simulator that we'll review. I found this um, in our research. That's really nice. You can see what it's like to listen to somebody in a coffee shop speaking a sentence and go through the different levels of hearing impairment mm. that somebody might have. So everything from normal to a severe hearing level impairment and what is that like for someone in a coffee shop? What is that like for someone sitting outside having a conversation? What is that like for someone talking to a child? What is that like for uh, you know a male versus a female talking in those di in different environments? And then I think most of you probably have seen this and if you haven't, try it. Um, this will give you at least a basic level um, to, to check that page. Or the pages that. And at the end, we can go on another tool that is open source or free, and you can feed your whole website rather than just the page because this one too only allows mm -hmm. you to check Facebook. The one that I'm talking to is they put the plugin in the Firefox or That's excellent. That's great. Mm -hmm. And here's just the WebAIM color contrastor, which we'll look at as well. And I know we're drawing this out. I have two more slides. We have two more slides. Um, essentially, Zaire and I really enjoy the human component of having these conversations and, and helping people to understand why and how accessibility is important. And in order to do that, you can create different things such as empathy maps or I'll, I'll show you personas as well. So an empathy map is essentially something that you can do in a few minutes where you just empathize with someone who's trying to buy that product that is on the website you're creating or use the service that you're trying to provide that's on the website you're creating and see um, what their senses might be. You know, What are they hearing? What's the message that they're seeing? What's, what is it that they're thinking about? And actually, you know, put yourself, try to put yourself, you know, in their shoes and empathize directly with them. What this does is it allows you, what we kind of do, Zayer and I, is we kind of create these personas. And we sort of put them in our back pocket, right? And we go into a meeting and we start talking about web accessibility. And we may have a conversation with some content editors or people that own a site and they ask questions and they don't maybe quite get in, you can actually pull out a persona and say, hey, here's, here's Fred and these are the ways that Fred is seeing your site. Here's, you know, Susie and these are the ways that Susie is seeing your site. And it just allows them to start seeing and empathizing with people that, that might need these. And I guess I should have gotten the personas. Yeah. yeah. So. All right. Um, We'll show you some of the personas that we've started. Uh, they are in beta, <laughs> I guess. Uh, we want them to be perfect. Yeah, we want them to be perfect before we shove them out there and share them. I'm a little bit cautious of just sharing them with you, you know. However, uh, you can actually see see what we're doing. Data is involved too. This is not just you know writing and empathizing. This is we are. This college is a one-to-one. -one. Everybody's required to buy a computer. These are the things the student's facing. Here's somebody that has, you know, these sort of accessibility needs, and they're having to buy this computer. And, and how is their experience in the classroom going to be different than the other students in the classroom? And somebody who has to be required to buy this computer is also required for accessibility purposes you know, on their own merit to like, purchase these thousands and thousands of dollars worth of equipment Right to use the web in an effective and efficient way for them to learn. So just understanding and empathizing with people is important. Yeah. Yeah. 
So we'll see. I'm going to have to come out of here and What would you guys prefer? Okay. Okay. I'm not sure what to hit to get that to go away. Hopefully we get out the corner. There. All right. So we started talking out about this WCAG. Uh, this is a something that I learned recently was that they have the quick quick reference. So you can actually filter based on what you're interested in. So if you'd like to see all the levels, um, or like we said, you know, level A and double A because that's what you're interested in, you can go through here and actually. You know, as Andrew mentioned, you know, focus specifically on ARIA and, and what areas uh, you should be thinking about for accessibility on your site. Um, yeah, so it's just a fast way for you to get the information you need. The other tool was, I think I forgot to pull up the, um, This is the other tool there's checklists for, so that you could actually have a checklist to follow and then have links to learn more about it, about these different topics. So if you're looking at the use of color, you can read about the use of color, what to do, tips, etc. And that's what I was saying when I mentioned it was a little more of a blog format. It just might, might be a faster way to to gain some understanding of these more technical tips and things. I'm going to let you demonstrate this. Um, would you like to, uh, if you would like to pull up a site, you could pull up Iowa State yeah. site because the plugin is actually there. So. Exit main four tab panel heading three. Skip navigation sign mail outlook blackboard access plus directory map safety contact plus ABC DEFGHIJ. So this is not an actual screen reader. This is a plugin. No, it's a it's a plugin simulator. It's a plugin that Chrome has called Chrome Box that allows you to yeah to briefly test if you want to experience how a screen reader works. It's not. It doesn't really replace what a screen reader does and different screen readers do different things and their users are experts on this specific screen reader they resort to. I, I have a graduate assistant who uses JAWS and he is an, an expert on JAWS. He's not an expert on what's what are the other ones? Anybody? BDA. Yeah. BDA. <laughs> exactly. So um, just so you know. So I use this to test things like really uh, doing curt type of cursory reviews. Oh, we're back. Where are we? You could stop and you know just refresh. There you go. So I see. So you have to learn how to navigate with this specific plugin. So you see that the user would have to navigate in a certain way, but you see that you provide a skip navigation link in case the user is a frequent user with the screen reader and you know, and he do, or he or she doesn't want to go through the, the whole oh you know alphabet, alphabet every time <laughs> <laughs> and things like that. Yeah. So that's just a brief demo. It's a really useful tool that Chrome has. Uh, other browsers have other tools. Chrome has a bunch of a tool set dealing with accessibility. So you can resort to those. Mm -hmm. Chrome, Chrome Box. Box. -O so we have access to know someone who uses the screen reader and you've got users 
to try and get this point across to other boxes. It's also helpful to use them. As yeah, them. definitely. We have boxes. Yeah. Yeah. Presentations on campus where I'll bring in the head of our, well, I always try to make a point to all of our users that yeah. who needs this? Well, the head of our history department is blind. And he's a long term professor and he uses the screen reader. And then some men will have them or another professor do uh, training with us where they go through and use the screen reader mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and show how they read the web and we talk about how to make it accessible for them. It, it really brings it to life yeah. for people and realize, yeah. okay, this is something that's used by people. Yeah. And it also freaks them out a little bit because someone who's blind and uses the screen reader goes Really fast. Super fast, yeah. And yeah. It just sounds, you're not used to listening to it, it just sounds like a door. Yeah. What's nice on, on campus, we have a web SIG group is what we call it, where it's basically anybody that uses, develops in web or anyone on campus who's interested for that matter comes together once a month to meet. And so we've had a couple meetings where we really talked about accessibility one time a year and brought in a speaker um, that he was the head of the School of the Blind. Or He's a technology consultant for the School of for the blind in mm -hmm. Iowa. His name is Chris yes. Brown. Um, he's blind himself, and he demoed to us how when he comes across a new page, a new web page, what he does is explore it by mm -hmm. resorting to the headings and the links. And that's his particular way of going about navigating the web. There might be other users who do it differently. But that's also another good way to bring it back to others that you work with throughout your um, areas and teams to bring in people. This is something else, this is what I was talking about with the different environments that you can actually hear what it might sound like in a coffee shop for someone with normal. Um, so that's normal. Mild. Something with severe. You can hardly hear. So that's an interesting tool. Um, I also what's, thought what's it was. One? What? What's that? One? Starkey, S T A R K E Y dot com slash hearing dash loss dash simulator. It's neat. I didn't think about someone who had a hearing impairment, what it might be like for them to hear a child versus a male voice versus a female voice. So this is interesting. Many days people say what a dull gray day. Many days people say what a dull gray day. I'm not sure how that's, I don't know what I did, but it's just a neat tool to see. Um, we're going to throw the world's worst site ever <laughs> in the way. <laughs> um. <laughs> so, it kind of flipped out wave there for a second. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So you, this is a way for you to actually. This is the one page tester where you can act, you can see some of the errors. So you can see the the missing alt text and all of these animated gifs and images, and uh, blinking content sort of things. So it also shows some good things. But we threw them on, under the bus, but that's precisely what they want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the color contrast checker. So the way where they all the contrast tab Oh go back. Okay. Check the black and white thing now. Twenty one, yeah. Oops. Twenty one. Twenty one to one. Okay. So now you see your um there's a green button below that you wave that's this style. Yep. If you go to the 
far right tab for contrast. Mm -hmm. Oh. And then what that will allow you yeah. to do under the contrast tools, below that you see small text and large text. And you have yeah, the paths are not, yeah. And so if you click on one of the red arrows, it will take you to that particular color. And now you can go and either lighten or darken, and it will tell you what the uh, acceptable you need to make it. That's so excellent. Maybe you can it once, mm -hmm. twice, and then you can see if you like that, that combination. If you don't, then you go back to your contract yeah. and start playing around with how it's going to work. It's a better combination. So There's another tool that will actually put you in the zones where it's just true. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have it in my. There's there, there's also an, uh, something for color blindness. So I have a friend who's colorblind. And it will ask you a series of questions or something, and how you answer them is how Chrome will change the colors that you see so that you can actually see them in a little bit better way. There is, Excellent. there are a number of resources that you can, I, I mean, look, uh, what I've been trying to do in my own efforts at Iowa State is to create awareness more than anything, but because there are so many resources out there uh, and also like trying to vet whatever is best for our content editors and our developers and our faculty, depending on the role that they have and the types of content that they develop, you know, try to identify what's best, best for them. This is just one of the many uh, color, you know, yeah, the one that we look simulators, like. but it's neat because you could actually upload an image that you're using yourself and see the differences. So this is an old, this is a vintage Drupal corn picture, but <laughs> that's what it is. Um, we touched on personas, mm -hmm. so there's a couple resources. Usability.gov has a persona resource. And then actually in my inbox, like yesterday when I got to it, I saw this from Palantir that night uh, about, about personas. So I think that's a good resource. It's really neat to see some of these um, articles that are coming out from anyone who you know has learned something or is excited about accessibility and can share it with others. You know, that's a nice, nice thing. I think that's about all we had for. Oh, we could share. I guess we could share. Oh yeah, one shout out. If you're an organization that has uh, resources available to hire assistance in checking for compliance or you need somebody to help you over a mediation of curiosity because <laughs> that can be, you know, every basic it's thorny. You know, the state government, don't put your agenda on your website as if you can yeah. create like a content type that would be agenda and make so that it's uh, clean. Uh, and you try, try to reduce that. But uh, if you need assistance, there's a firm coming to Criterion 508. Yeah. And they do a great job. They do training as well for like their end users. Mm -hmm. And they have online training. So if you just give them a shout out. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and it's neat to see that there's some resources popping up more so than there has been in the past. That is kind of something that they can so this is just an example of our many um, personas. We have some personas for diversity uh, as well. So this is kind of what they look like. They're not, they don't have to be extravagant. They're just, it's nice to just have a little bit of content. These are very beta for us, but this is what we're doing. No. Do you buy any of those people? Mm, no. <laughs> I those get them are, for, well, those are I always resort to Creative Commons okay. or whatever yeah, the university has rights. Yeah. So, so, so what yes. are you? What's your methodology for the data collection that you actually are using for creating the personas? For, for creating the personas? we resorted to the fact book, to different resources, web mm -hmm. analytics, the fact book, and even um, you know uh, whatever experiences. And whatever, well, like 
for me, it's data about disabilities and mm -hmm. diversity in, in the university. I resorted to the registrar's office as well. I uh, conducted a survey of um, the clientele from the disability resources office, and I learned about them. So all the all those data are are subsumed into the personas. Yeah, I think it's important to actually, you know, yeah, look at who. You know, in our case, we're looking at the university. What data does the university have? So wherever you're building the website, or who you're building the website for, who, who their audiences are, and then the, the data, just general national data even, you know, yeah. can help you drive a persona. The other thing that we try to tell our, um, our content managers, uh, as well as our developers, is that well, it's the law, okay? It is mm -hmm. the law, and you have to comply. And I know that it's a pain, um, and, and it takes some extra effort, um, and that it's, and it's not perfect, and it's sort of an evolutionary thing. So, so there's a law that was like, oh, do you want to be the one that's responsible for the Department of Justice coming and um, delivering a really unpleasant letter to the president of your company, your department director, or whatever? No. Right. But the better thing to say is it's a design principle that makes the website better for everyone mm -hmm. because you're on a mobile device and if you don't have to sell gas, it's hard to see when you are out in the sun, etc. So good content is good for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, your navigation issues are good for everybody. Mm -hmm. And you know, not many people are gonna have an accident and I'm right, Rob. Being a sling and now to be left handed and you know, or have to use the keyboard to tap your mm -hmm. maps is it's important for everybody. So it's not just for individuals. So yes. that that your case brings yes. us to evidence that disability is not something that it's static. We might like as we grow older we develop more disabilities. I I can't read like I used to anymore and things like that. So yeah, it's not something that you can say you're you know, you have a disability and you won't have a disability ever in your life. Those ramps, you know, you think of something with disability, but it's parents with strollers and I love the fact that you now don't have to first have Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. One of the challenges I run into in graphic design is you create a name with text in it. One of those tools is it. For instance, mm -hmm. the state of Iowa and the county, what font do you get, what color would you do? And <laughs> that graphic yeah. manager gets up to when they are used for navigation. Yeah. So intervene at the source. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Like even before the image is created. Yeah. Right. Dirt, while the image is being created, feedback on whether or not it's going to have this. It was okay when it was in the Navy, and when they said you need to change the makeup and say, I'm going to go to the next step. You have to hold out the weight of it. Yeah. 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 Ye
What about when the price drops all that? Right. There's a price on all of it, right? Right. I mean, you could yeah, say, no, I mean, yeah. I mean, even the fact, like, even if there is this, like, this free checker, there's a price on the person that's having to run the, the checker and, and then doing it, right? So there's, there's costs all the way down the line. And essentially, personally, I think it's important to try to start baking right. some of this in, but it's, it, we can do what we can to help those in the decision-making roles see how it can benefit them. I think that if you take the time to do it in advance, you could save yourself a lot of money later when someone comes knocking on the door with a case against you, your organization. Um, so that's one way. But we feel, Zaire and I feel that also it's important Okay, <laughs> it's important to hit home at the other topics that we've talked about, the, hu the human side of this. And no, yeah, right, exactly. So it, coming coming at it from multiple angles, I think is helpful. So thank you. You had a you had and, a question. One out of twelve. Yeah. Oh, yes. Another good point. Absolutely. Lost customers. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh. And it's going to make it less successful. So like, I think, I think it's a really good opportunity to um, you know, we choose the accessibility on the side of, you know, say, like, you know, you take away from the unusable stuff. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>